All right. So good to see everybody on here today. Today we're going to be going over a C7 complete spinal cord injury. So this is probably one of the most common spinal cord levels that's going to show up on the boards. Again, they could ask you about any level in particular, but this is probably one of the ones I would definitely keep an eye on because C7 is pretty important because that's where we get our tricep use. So brief overview before we get into the meat of going over specifically a C7 spinal cord injury. Spinal cords are classified by the Asia scale. So this is just their main way that they make it easy for everybody to um, kind of organize their thoughts when it comes to seeing what kind of spinal cord level is and the intensity and the amount of damage that has been done by the lesion. So in regards to um, the Asia scale, we're mostly on the boards going to deal with the Asia scale A. So this means it is a complete spinal cord injury. There's no sensory or motor sensation below the level of the lesion. So this is where they're testing um, their sacral segments to see if there's anything all the way at the end, because if there's nothing at the sacral level, then nothing's getting there below the level of the lesion. So Asia scale A is just the board's fancy way of saying a complete spinal cord injury. So that means I'd like to think A, Etiology, so how are people going to be getting a spinal cord injury? Well, the most common reason is going to be a motor vehicle accident, either a rear end or a head-on collision. Honestly, it could be anything, but usually the front to back are kind of the most common ways that they're gonna be getting this. Um, again, I would just say motor vehicle accident is the most common way you would get this. Don't worry about the different types of ways that's kind of getting into some real specifics there. Um, violence is probably this, this is the second most common way that people are going to get a spinal cord injury. This is due to either gunshot wounds or stab wounds. You're more likely going to see that present as a brown saccards incomplete spinal cord injury. And I'll go over that in another video. But that's where one half of the spinal cord is um, damaged and the other half is okay. Then there's all this like fancy stuff. So that's the type of incomplete. But you could just get stabbed through the whole spinal cord and boom, there goes everything um, and a fall is more common with elderly patients. So that's why we, this is another one of those risk factors that we really want to make sure our geriatric patients are not falling because it could be worse than just the broken foot. They could end up having a spinal cord injury. And if they're already old and prone for falling, having a spinal cord injury is the last thing that they would, anybody honestly would want. So got to pay attention with that. And again, this is kind of important to know because when they're talking about like which person would be most susceptible for a spinal cord injury, there is a higher prevalence of spinal cord injuries among men and white people or Caucasians, however, that the boards is going to ask that. They're going to say Caucasians on the board, but kind of remembering that the peak incidence also for someone to receive a spinal cord injury is between 15 and 30 years old, and this is because there's a lot of dumb decisions made by people whose prefrontal cortexes are not fully developed, and that happens when you're 25, so... If you're thinking of who's most susceptible for a spinal cord injury, it is a young white man. So that kind of is what it would look like and who's most likely to get one. Um, what does a spinal cord injury look like? So as I said before, the most likely person is a young white man. Acute stage of spinal cord injury would mean this is immediately after they've had one. We're probably not going to see this patient because we're going to get them more on the later stages of rehab, but it's important to know the pathology of kind of what happens with a spinal cord injury. Immediately after they had their injury, they're going to be going into spinal shock. So this is where everything controlled by the CNS is just, just shuts off. So it's called a uh, CNS depression, so central nervous system depression. And essentially this is all happening below the level of the lesion. So for example, with our C7 spinal cord injury, everything controlled below C7 is gone off. Total flaccid paralysis. That means that there's, a, there's no tone in the muscle at all and it's not contracting on its own. Can't do anything, can't send any signals to it. It's done. A lot of people, once they have a spinal cord injury and are transported to the hospital, because again, most of these are happening in a violent, traumatic way, they are needing surgery immediately to stabilize everything that's happening, either that's systemically or within the spinal cord itself. A lot of patients are going to have rods placed in their back, kind of, it's the same rods that they'll use for scoliosis, but it's more for stabilization and reconstructing this 
spinal column because again if you're having a spinal cord injury you're probably having uh fractures and all this other bad stuff happening to the spinal column and vertebrae itself once this patient is stable however that's when we're probably going to be seeing it in the them in the clinic this um, is going to present as spasticity so again it'll be flaccid and then all of a sudden the muscles are will start coming back and they'll start contracturing and they'll be spastic they'll be hyper reflexive all this kind of crazy stuff going on with the muscles because all of a sudden they have some sensation starting to come back after they're out of that spinal shock after that, we need to be careful with possible autonomic dysreflexia, and I do go over it in the next slide. This is a very, very life-threatening condition, and it can happen with spinal cord injuries above the level of T6. So these patients, again, cannot thermoregulate. They're going to need blankets and stuff because they're going to get cold. They're going to have difficulty breathing because they've lost innervation to pretty much all of their um, muscles of expiration to help them cough and cl airway clearance. So they're going to have problems with that. Be careful with skin breakdown with this patient because they can't move. So then they might have their skin starting to kind of rub and pressure injuries and all that stuff. We don't want to wound with someone who's already suffering from a spinal cord injury. And then for this specific patient, they're going to hopefully regain control of their triceps completely. So again, how are we treating this patient when we see them? The first thing that we're going to worry about, and these are huge questions that the boards are going to want to ask and quiz you on, because remember, the MPTE is trying to protect the public from you. It sounds bad, but that's just kind of how it's going to be going. So remember, autonomic dysreflexia. So this is a very life-threatening situation. It is a severe, severe, severe elevation in blood pressure in patients with spinal cord injuries at the T6 level and above. So if you're having a patient presented on the boards who is a T6 or above patient, just kind of think in the back of your head, okay, this could be a patient that might end up having some sort of autonomic dysreflexia. Keep that in your arsenal of things to think about when you're looking that you have a spinal cord patient. So remember, the first thing that we're doing with this patient, and they're going to present with like sweating, high blood pressure, they're going to look really clammy, and they're going to be like uh, breathing very, very quickly. The first thing you're going to do is sit this patient up. So this is the opposite of orthostatic hypotension. With autonomic dysreflexia, you're sitting the patient up. Then what you're going to do after you have sat the patient up, so again, sitting the patient up is the very first thing you want to do no way around it, sit them up. Then you are checking the catheter because remember a spinal cord injury patient is going to be catheterized because they don't have control of their sacral, sacral reflexes, which is the lowest level. So they need a catheter in order to be able to not urinate on themselves. Then you're going to check any other tubes to see what is the noxious stimuli that is causing autonomic dysreflexia because that is what ends up causing it. There's something that's irritating the body. It's freaking out. It's spiking the blood pressure. That's kind of what's going on. Usually it's a kinked catheter. So if that's the case, just fix everything. And after that, you've sat them up and fixed it, it should start to go down. Again, this is a situation where if it's not going down, it's not getting any better. You can't figure out what's going on. That's when you get the nurse. Again, big other things for safety with this patient is checking for skin breakdown and teaching weight shifting or repositioning. So this is the very first thing we want to teach our patients is how to check them, be able to check themselves to make sure that they are not getting any sort of pressure sores. And then to also be able to like weight shift in their chair if they can while they're sitting there. And then also to make sure that they can reposition themselves, whether that means they kind of have to grab their own leg and help themselves roll along. We have to make sure that we're teaching them that because the last thing we want for any patient who is immobilized in any sort of way and cannot move themselves is for them to have skin breakdown. And these patients who cannot move are the most susceptible. And if they already have a spinal cord injury, they don't need another thing on their plate like that. So again, check for skin breakdown. You're gonna give them blankets because they're gonna get cold because they cannot thermoregulate. So you gotta make sure that you're keeping them warm when they're getting cold. And then you gotta make sure that you're cooling them off if they're starting to get warm. We're gonna help them learn some airway techniques. Again, respiratory therapists or RT friends are going to be the ones who are gonna be leading on this if you're in an acute care setting. However, we should also be educating them and facilitating this because it is something that we wanna make sure that our patients are aware of as they are coming along with their recovery. So how are we treating it with PT specific interventions? Again, the biggest thing I'm saying, and I'm gonna harp on this until like literally the day I die, 
patient education, repositioning, all that stuff. Again, for this patient specifically, a spinal cord injury, compensatory techniques are okay. So a lot of our patients out there were like, no, don't compensate for this. Don't like try to like a shoulder hike or anything, blah, blah, blah. With our spinal cord patients, they're allowed to cheat. They can cheat. We can help them with compensatory techniques for transfer, such as the um, hip head relationship. We can work on mobility and um, activities of daily living. Those can all be modified in certain ways to help the patient, you know, get to where they need to go. And then strengthening their triceps because this specific patient at the C7 level, they now have innervation of their triceps. So that's a big one that we want to strengthen because that's going to help them with that push-up transfer to help them get into another chair, get into their wheelchair, transfer to the mat table, get into their car, give them a lot more independence with that. So then they don't have to rely on other people to help. The triceps are huge. Again, pressure relief, teaching them how to use a wheelchair because with patients who are have a spinal cord injury, all of them are going to be using a wheelchair for community navigation, regardless of their level, even if it's a lower level, because it's going to conserve the most energy. So these patients are going to try, we're going to teach them to be as independent in their wheelchair as they possibly can, teach them self-range of motion techniques. So like lifting their arms, trying to lift their legs, pull them to their chest and anything just to keep them moving to prevent any sort of contractures. And again, teaching them how to navigate their community because they no longer have use of their legs and they've use their legs their whole life. So we have to reteach them how to integrate into the community. Again, the biggest thing for all spinal cord injuries that are going to have in common is that they all will need a bowel and bladder program because they do not have control of the sacral reflexes for controlling their bowel and bladder. So this is going to be in the form of intermittent catheterization, timed voiding, all of this stuff that's just going to make sure that they are keeping on a schedule to make sure that they are not having any issues when it comes to that, because that is also, that is something that is not just dangerous to the patient to have any sort of maceration going on down there. It is also something that patients feel more in control of themselves when they have their bowel and bladder program to avoid any sort of, you know, shame or criticism from the community. So keywords or concepts that we want to think of when it comes to a C7 spinal cord injury is the Asia scale A. That is our big key that is telling us blinking in our face that this is a complete spinal cord injury. So when you have a complete spinal cord injury, you do not have to worry about like, oh, is there like sensation, vibration, proprioception going on below the level? No, everything's gone. It's, it's sad, but it's, it's easy to remember nothing's happening below the level of the lesion. These patients at the C7 level are independent with all of their transfers because they have use of their triceps. And remember, for a patient, the highest patient that can um, begin to help transfer themselves, they're going to need a max assist is the C5 level, is the highest level of spinal cord injury that they could possibly use a slide board transfer for. Again, we have to think of the functional abilities of a patient at this level. They are able to use their triceps, big thing, independent with their transfers, all that stuff. We got to just see what's going on at this specific level. They'll start saying some functional things. It'll literally just be like they can do a push-up transfer or transfer independently into their car with use of their triceps. That's kind of how they're going to go about it. This patient can use a manual wheelchair because they have their... Um, Again, they have a lot of use of their upper extremities that they're able to propel their wheelchair. Again, the highest spinal cord level that requires, um, that is able to use a manual wheelchair is a C5 level. Again, this patient is able to feed themselves and grip things by using tenodesis. So that's the one where they take their wrist and they cock it back to be able to pick up objects. So for example, let me grab this. At the C7 level, they're able to use that tenodesis. Let me stop my share because I wanted you guys to see this. So the tenodesis is what is able to be used at the C6 level. So C7s have use of this because they have everything above, nothing below. So the C6 level, if you bring your wrist back, it will curl your fingers. So for example, if I'm picking up a pen, I go like this, that's the tenodesis. So then they can use that to be able to feed themselves, to groom themselves. And even if they want to make it easier to hold on to which some patients end up doing this. This is something I learned from an OT. You can take like a hair tie or something and put it on the patient like that. So then they don't even have to tenodesis that. They can just, or the, it just gives them a little extra stability. So that's a fun thing that these patients can do. Just a fun little party trick that you can show people. And then also a young white man is in the description of 
what's going on with this patient because that's the demographic that is most likely to end up getting a spinal cord injury. So sample question, guys. A physical therapist assistant is helping teach a C7 Asia scale A patient with functional activities around the home. Which functional activity would be most unrealistic for this patient to perform? One, reaching arm above head. Two, push-up transfer from wheelchair into car. Three, gripping a cup with a full fist. Or four, picking up a fork with modification. So I'll give you guys a second to think about this answer. All right, guys, so the answer is number three, gripping a cup with a full fist. So again, the last muscles that are innervated by this uh, level of a spinal cord injury because it's a C7 is going to be the triceps. At C8, you get control of the wrist flexors. And again, some of the finger flexors as well, but it isn't until you get to like the T1 end of end side of T8 of C8 mostly T1, that's where you get your intrinsics of your hand. So that's where you're able to make that full fist grip. You have that opposition and then you have full use of your upper extremity. So again, that whole gripping motion doesn't really happen until you have a patient who has a C8 or lower. Again, mostly T1 kind of level. So this would be an unrealistic thing for this patient to do because again, they do not have full use of their hand to grip objects. They can only really pick things up with that tenodesis. So I hope that this was helpful guys and I will see you in the next video. Actually, hold on. Before I go to the next video, let me explain why. Number one, reaching arm above head. So you can get your arm above your head at like the C5, C6-ish level because remember you have innervation of all the flexors of your shoulder at that level. So mostly C6, by the time you get to C6, you're pretty much good to go reaching overhead. So a C7 patient could do that. Push-up transfer from a wheelchair, as we said before, that is the prime thing that the C7 patients can do. Keep that in your mind. That is very important. Gripping the cup, that is more C8, T1 kind of stuff with intrinsics of the hand. Picking up the fork with a modification, that's the tenodesis that happens at C6. Anyways, okay, now, does anybody have any sort of questions before I get off today? I hope that this was helpful in explaining kind of what's going on at the C7 spinal cord level and then pretty much all the important things that the boards is going to ask you about spinal cord injuries in regards to safety. It's less about the spinal cord level. That's like half of it. It's more about the safety in regards to treating patients who end up having a spinal cord injury because the boards likes to test you more on safety. So I would say when you're encountering any sort of spinal cord injury, to be sure that um, you are aware of what level does what thing. So less dermatomy, more myotomy, seeing what key muscles do what at what level. And then the big thing is making sure the safety. And again, with the autonomic dysreflexia, that can happen to any patient at the T6 level or above. So T6. Anyway, okay guys, I'm gonna hop off. Um, let me know if you have any questions if you're watching this on replay. Take care guys, see you later.